Great. So I'm really moved to be in such a, a company. Um, I would like to thank, uh, of course, um, the organizers of this um, meeting, meeting of uh, uh, young people or less young people uh, and myself. It's uh, fantastic. Um, I would also like to say just a few words on uh, passion for knowledge. Uh, I think this is abs absolutely admirable, you know, what you have done. Uh, and um, I know you do not like me, you know, to talk for minutes about, uh, you know, passion for knowledge. <laughs> okay, okay, then you deserve it, you know. So uh, again, I would like to com compliment you. I think everybody agrees that it's a fantastic event. And all the people I, I could speak to, you know, uh, at this meeting, or four years ago, when I was also at the, the same Passion for Knowledge meeting, everybody was so enthusiastic. So this is really fantastic. So maybe I can have my slides now. Thank you. So let me first say that I prepared a uh, relatively short talk. And um, again, I would like to thank, uh, sorry, it's okay. Yeah, wait, see. I would like to thank um, uh, Dr. Andres Aris Coretta for inviting me to visit here. Uh, we had a very good contact, very friendly. Uh, and I, would, I will now start my, uh, my lecture. I promise not to speak for very long. Doesn't seem to work. Uh, yeah, I'm too, too far away, probably. Uh, or you cannot do anything. No. No, no. Uh, yeah. no, no, it has to be like that. Yeah. I'm very familiar. You know. <laughs> And so I prepared a very small introduction on molecular sciences. You know, not everybody is familiar with uh, molecules. And uh, the definition of a molecule, yeah, maybe don't take it as an insult, you know, if you have good notions of chemistry. But um, so a molecule is a set of atoms, and these atoms are connected to one another uh, using chemical bonds. So, oops, could you go back? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's probably easier if I ask you to change the slide. And so we have here two examples. Uh, water, very, very simple. CO2. And if I drew CO2 here, uh, it is because CO2 is highly criticized. You know. Everybody has the impression that it's a poison, you know. This is not true. We have too much CO2 in our atmosphere. There is no debate on that. It's very clear. But without CO2 in our atmosphere, we will all die rapidly. No photosynthesis, which means no plants, and, uh, and nothing to eat for the mammals. Uh, and for us, no mammals to eat anymore. So we will just disappear. Uh, you can notice here you have nitrogen. Um, yeah, you have nitrogen. And nitrogen is the, one of the most stable molecules. It has three bonds here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you. And so uh, nitrogen is extremely stable. As you can see, we have three chemical bonds between two nitrogen atoms, and you can hardly uh, destroy uh, nitrogen, N2. Yeah, maybe we... Uh, Yeah, I think it could be easier if I just say next slide, you know. Okay. Yeah, okay. 
And so this is the, the second example, a very simple molecule, again, benzene. And I just uh, drew it here because there is some kind of convention, you know, in molecular um, sciences, is that carbon atoms are no more represented by the letter C, but simply uh, we take, uh, uh, let's say, a hexagon like this. So this is the chemical bond between two carbon atoms, and we do not put C, it is simply um, the vertex of this hexagon. So we have six vertices here, and these six vertices represent the six carbon atoms. Next slide. Just to show you that we have seen very, very simple molecules, but chemists are able to make incredibly complex molecules. So this is called synthesis, organic synthesis, and it is one of the most important uh, talents uh, of the chemists to make very complicated molecules. And here is an example. This is brevetoxin A. Uh, we are not going to discuss the structure of this molecule. Uh, I think it is very impressive, as you will certainly agree with me, I'm sure. Uh, so this molecule was made some time ago by a group led by Casey Nicolau, uh, in California, and uh, there were maybe 20 people working on the synthesis of this molecule for 12 years. So there was a paper, um, this, uh, a big review article, and they said a 12-year odyssey leading to brevetoxin A. So if you calculate, it means that you have between two and three centuries of work for making this molecule. And you may wonder, why is it so important? It's very obvious to show that mankind is able to make very complicated molecules, which are natural substances. And in addition, each time you add tools to the toolbox of the chemist, uh, on the way they discover many novel and exciting reactions. So um, it is really very important to make uh, very complicated molecules. Next slide. Now we spoke about the nanometer. And Professor Echenike told you that a nanometer is very tiny. Uh, and we will just see an example. So some time ago, the people discovered C60. So this is an incredible molecule, C60. It's a soccer ball at a nanometer uh, scale. And uh, it was totally found by accident, you know, and this is also why I like to discuss this example, because there is a very nice word in English, which is serendipity. And serendipity means discovery by accident, not, not planned uh, discovery. And the people were working on the, um, the molecules found in space, you know, uh, and uh, in space, you have lots and lots of molecules, and they were trying to repeat the conditions which led to those molecules, and they found something which was totally different uh, compared to what they, they were expecting, which is C60, so this molecule. And uh, C60 is a tiny species. Uh, it is one nanometer large, it's a small sphere, one nanometer diameter, and perhaps a comparison to show you that the nanometer is really small. Uh, the ratio between a nanometer and one meter, let's say one meter would be here, is the same as the ratio between a small bar of 30 centimeters and the distance between Earth and the moon. So it shows that it's really tiny. So next slide, please. <coughs> so, now a very important statement in relation to the work of my group. Uh, synthetic molecules are considered as static objects. Uh, of course, they can distort, they can vibrate, they can elongate, contract, uh, but um, before the work on molecular machines, 
Uh, these molecules uh, were considered as static in the sense that we could not control their motions. By the way, synthetic molecules are very important. And uh, you know or you don't know, but mankind made something like uh, seven or eight millions of new molecules. So chemists have been very productive uh, during one and a half centuries. In biology, controlled motion is very, very important. It is absolutely crucial. And uh, before we talk about uh, uh, chemical uh, artificial molecular motors, I would like to stress that uh, any living organism um, uses molecular machines, molecular motors, and some of them are absolutely essential. Uh, linear motors, like a piston moving in a cylinder, uh, even walkers, a molecule which can walk uh, on a rail, uh, systems undergoing contraction and intention, extension, and these systems belong to the very general family of motor proteins. And motor proteins are everywhere. Next slide. So we will talk about two examples, ATP synthase, which is a rotary motor, and kinesin. So let's go uh, and take a look. Next slide. at uh, ATP synthase. So probably you know that ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the fuel of life. So we all rely on ATP. Uh, when you take your car, you burn fuel. Uh, but when you move, uh, whatever you do, you consume energy. And this energy is ATP, the fuel of life. And ATP, uh, it's a relatively simple molecule. It is degraded to ADP. And there is an enzyme, a big enzyme, which is called ATP synthase, uh, whose function is to regenerate ATP after it has been degraded. Exactly as if you were burning fuel, and then you collect CO2 and water, which are produced during the combustion process, and you regenerate the fuel. CO2 plus H2O will give you back your fuel. This is a very important uh, enzyme. Anything which lives on Earth is based on ATP and ATP synthase. Perhaps uh, something uh, funny, uh, but every day you regenerate about one half of your own weight of ADP to ATP. So personally, then, I, uh, I fabricate something like 35 or 38 kilos of ATP every day. You can easily calculate for you. It's not a minor enzyme, you know. Next slide. And uh, this enzyme has been studied very much in detail. And uh, now it is very well understood. It's a rotary motor. So uh, maybe you can push here. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it's a rotary motor, so you have a rotor here. Uh, you have something which is uh, kind of motionless. It's a big cluster of proteins. And as the rotor functions, rotates inside this uh, uh, set of six proteins, you make ATP, which is the purple species, out of ADP the yellow one, and inorganic phosphate. So it works perfectly well, and as I said, it is absolutely uh, essential to anything which lives on Earth. Next slide. Another example is very spectacular. This is the, the kinesin, and the kinesin, again, has a very important function in the cells. Uh, the function is to transport matter within the cell from one place to another place. So in the cell, you have uh, uh, biosynthetic factories which make the molecules we need, proteins, hormones, pieces of DNA, pieces of RNA, and all that cannot stay at the same place. It doesn't stay at the factory. 
It is exactly as if you were making trains here and uh, you just keep them here and here and here and they will never travel to some other places where they are needed. Next slide. And you have a kinesin, which is a walker. So in the cell, you have those big uh, tubules. It's a microtubule, they say. Uh, very long, it can be one micron long. And next slide. And uh, on this uh, tubule, you have the kinesin. As I said, it's a walker. It's about 30 nanometers long, uh, 10 nanometers wide or so. And at the back of the kinesin, you have a big bag, a huge bag. And this bag is full of molecules, the molecules which have to be transported from one place to another place. And in fact, it seems to walk very slowly, uh, but it runs like crazy. You know, if you, if you think this is a human being, it walks at about 150 kilometers an hour. So very, very efficient. Next slide. Now we are going to talk about catenanes and rataxanes, mostly. And I will just give you a few definitions. Next slide. So a catenane is a species of liston. So it's a molecule. Uh, a two catenane is a molecule containing two interlocking rings. It seems to be very easy, you know, very, very naive chemistry. A rotaxane is a bit similar. And so this species, a two catenane, uh, as I said, seems to be very simple, but nobody could make uh, catenanes for uh, decades and decades and decades. And so these molecules have been uh, the subject of discussions, uh, very animated discussions, for more than a century. Uh, but it, they were considered as almost impossible to make. And so our main contribution uh, was to make catenanes easily and uh, in a way to allow chemists to make catenanes very, very easily in their research laboratories. So that was the main, uh, uh, the main contribution of my group. So next slide. And the question you may ask is why are catenanes and rotaxanes uh, so important in relation to the field of molecular machines. Next slide. And it's very obvious, if you have a catenane, let's say this one, or rotaxanes, this one or that one. Next slide. You can easily figure out that uh, the systems can be set in motion. Here, again, you have a linear motor, like a piston and a cylinder. Uh, here you have something which rotates or pirouettes, the same here. And so the conclusion is that catenanes and rotaxanes are very well adapted to large amplitude motions and to the design and synthesis of molecular machines. So that was even before molecular machines were made. Next slide. So I should say that when we started in this field, uh, my group was much more interested in uh, other topics, uh, catalysis or uh, photochemistry, and in particular with uh, my former boss and a very, very close friend, uh, Jean-Marie Laine, uh, when I was kind of an associate uh, CNRS professor, we had been working on trying to split the water molecule to H2 and one half O2. A very exciting project. And uh, as you will see, we could connect both fields, uh, photochemistry and water splitting with catenanes. Next slide. So that was really um, a big project. Uh, many, many groups had been dreaming of uh, being able to split the water molecule using solar energy uh, in order to generate the, the fuel, the ideal fuel H2. The ideal fuel, and I think you, you envision using hydrogen as a fuel for, uh, yeah, for trains. Uh, of course, it is the ideal fuel because when you burn it, 
to just produce water. No pollution, no uh, global warming. And so we had been working on that. We had some success, uh, but still it is very difficult to cleave water to H2 and O2. And if we want to have, um, let's say, commercially available devices, we still have to be a bit patient. You know, it doesn't work so, so nicely. So next slide. So at the time, the, the main hero of this research was this molecule. So Ru is ruthenium, and if you know the periodic table, ruthenium is just below iron, and ruthenium uh, is a very um, rare metal, very, very expensive. And so although this molecule was very exciting, able to harvest solar light, um, very, very efficiently. Uh, it was not promised to a great future because ruthenium is too expensive and too rare. So we had to find something else, and we thought that uh, uh, copper could be an interesting alternative. And so we uh, embarked in a big project uh, with an American friend, Dave McMillan at Purdue University, in uh, Indiana, and we made a copper complex. So we take a molecule of this type, relatively simple. It's a crescent, crescent shaped molecule, and we can make easily this compound with a copper center here. Now, <coughs> so that was fine. Um, many photochemists were very much interested in that because the copper complex had very interesting properties, but there was something else. And the something else is probably much more important than photochemistry. So if you go, go on, we will materialize the endpoints. Here we have two endpoints for this part, the vertical uh, fragment, blue, now we will materialize the endpoints of the horizontal fragments. Thank you. So they are the red points. And now we will interconnect the two blue points here and separately the two red dots here. They will be interconnected using an an organic fragment, a molecular fragment. And so what do you obtain? It's a test. <laughs> you obtain a catenane because you made a ring here, let's say the vertical ring, and another ring here, which is the horizontal ring. And so those two rings are married forever. You know, they are interlocking with one another and you will not be able to separate them without breaking the chemical bond. And so when we saw that, we thought, well, it's, it's very exciting because cationanes seem to be unknown and exceedingly difficult to make. And um, in theory, we have a very easy approach. We should be able to make cationanes very easily. And so we stopped catalysis, we stopped inorganic photochemistry, and we jumped in another field, which was basically virgin, which was to make catenanes. So on the next slide, we made catenanes thanks to the, the work of um, a very good friend of mine, who was a genius. Experimentally, she was incredibly good. And we, within a one, less than one year, we had our first publication. Uh, and we published in French. You know, it was kind of provocative uh, to force uh, English-speaking people uh, to learn a little bit of something else than English. You know, <laughs> but to be honest, you know, in English it would be a new family of molecules, metallocatenanes. I, mean, I think if an English-speaking person doesn't understand the title, he has a problem. <laughs> And so we published that, and that was the beginning of a new field. Um, I think all of a sudden, uh, many, many groups understood that catenanes are now accessible, and if they want to make catenanes, it's not going to be a big deal. So, next slide. 
So uh, <coughs> these are the molecules we made, uh, copper here and the two rings, and we can remove the copper. We obtain a new species, which is metal-free. So now, uh, yeah, please. And again, again, yeah. And you see the two structures. So this is crystallography. No need to insist on that, but you can see the shapes of these molecules. So one is very compact, and the other is very open. Next slide. So now let me explain you the principle of uh, the very first molecular machine we made in Strasbourg, uh, which is a catenin. So again. So, uh, well, I think we, you can. Uh, yeah, that's it. So we start from a catenin. You see a ring here, another ring here. And this ring, the second ring, is a little bit more complicated than the first one because we have three nitrogen atoms here. We will not spend too much time on the principle, you know, but if we change the, uh, let's say, the, the status of the copper center here, if we go from cop copper 1 plus to copper 2 plus, this will have uh, a very important effect. It will force the system to rearrange completely. So we will go from copper 1 to copper 2, go back to copper 1, and this is shown on the next slide. So, copper 2 now. The ring rearranges, so you have some kind of rotation. Copper 1, we inject an electron, we go back to the original state, and the system rearranges. And this is quantitative. Uh, there is no degradation, no fatigue uh, at all. So that was one of the very, very first molecular machines made by chemists. Next slide. So at the same time, and exactly the same year, our good friends in the US, Stoddart, Kiefer, uh, and, uh, and two postdoctoral fellows, uh, Cordoba and uh, Bissell, so they made a molecular shuttle. And a molecular shuttle, so next slide. A molecular shuttle is quite simple. It is simply um, a rotaxane yeah. uh, with um, a ring which can go from the green station to the right station and go back. And so that was, of course, very exciting. It was a, a, a nice motion, very clean motion. Uh, and um, the people uh, proposed something also very exciting after some time, probably, I don't know, more than 20 years. Next slide. They made a rotaxane, uh, a very long rotaxane, but don't, don't focus too much on the details. But here we have a ring, the blue ring, and it can move from the green station to the right station, and it moves if, if you use an electrical signal. So you send an electron, it will move from here to here. You abstract an electron, it will go back from here to here. And the beauty is that depending on where the ring is sitting, here or here, the electronic conductivity of the wire here, of the axis, is very strongly affected. So what can you do? You can do everything that a computer can do. You can write, you send an electron, or you do not send anything, so the ring will be here or here. Then you read, you measure electronic conductivity, you know exactly where it is. And finally, you erase, uh, you apply a strong potential, electric potential, and everybody, all the rings go back to the original uh, place. So this is really uh, writing, reading, erasing what you need if you want to make a computer. So that was, everybody thought, on the way towards uh, molecular computing, or at least towards 
uh, storing and processing information using molecules. But there were difficulties related to the fact that molecules can be fragile, and if you have a, a transistor, you can operate it a million times, uh, but not a molecule. I think after a hundred times, it's a bit tired, so it couldn't find applications, at least for the moment. Next slide. So I will uh, just take one or two examples. Uh, probably the most uh, popular examples coming from my group is that of an artificial muscle. Artificial muscle, it's a little bit uh, exaggerated. It's a molecular system which can elongate and contract at will by sending a, me a message, sending a signal uh, to the molecule. So on the next slide. Uh, so this is the way our muscles function. So the striated muscles, uh, in fact, you do not contract anything uh, because you have filaments which glide along one another. This is the principle, you know, our muscles. Those filaments, the, the red filaments and the blue filaments, they can glide. And of course, if you glide in this direction, you contract. And if you glide again, but in the opposite direction, you elongate uh, the system. And on the next slide, just to show you what we did, it took us some time, but finally, uh, we were very happy to have a, a nano muscle. Uh, so this is the, the species. We have a pale blue filament with a ring here, a dark blue filament, again, with a ring, and two stoppers, which will prevent the system from dissociating. And on the next slide, you can see that you contract, you go from eight nanometers to six nanometers, and you can go back. So that was the first nanomuscle, so to say, and um, quite a few people were uh, interested in this uh, piece of work. On the next slide, I will uh, finish up by showing you the, uh, the beautiful work of Feringa and his group. And these people have been interested in rotary motors. I think we can skip, you know, this part. It's very complicated. Uh, you have to, to be a chemist, in a way. Um, but if you go to the next slide, uh, you can enjoy a beautiful movie. Uh, they made a movie to show how it works. So now it's a photochemically active system. You shine light on the system, and it will react by rotating. So next slide, please. Yeah. So now you shine light. You heat. You shine light, you heat. So you have four signals, you know, light, heating, light, heating, and you perform a complete turn. And I hope you can, you can visualize that. Can, can you see that it's rotating? Yes, great. Some people have difficulties and I cannot help, you know. Uh, and so that was the beginning of the, of the field. Again, it was published in 1999. And at the time, uh, to do a full term uh, took about uh, one afternoon. So. so it was not a very fast system. And nowadays, they are in the nanosecond time scale. And I think this is a good lesson. When you start in a field, it can be extremely difficult. You know, you're a bit disappointed. But if you insist, you know, if you put all your passion, uh, Pedro, in, in your work, you know, finally, after 20 years or so, you get something which is very impressive. Next slide. Just to finish up, this is the very last uh, scientific slide. Uh, the people use the same principle. So you have the, the rotary motor here, the rotary motor here. And you can attach this species onto a cell, a living cell. And now you shine light. And what do you have here? You have a drill. You drill, you drill, you make a hole. And once you have a hole, you can even inject uh, a molecule to destroy the cell, if you like. And I think this is very, very promising for 
nanomedicine, the future of nanomedicine. Next slide. So here is a list of uh, many, uh, many, many uh, <coughs> um, molecular machines. Uh, so there are new molecular machines basically every, every month. You know, you have some beautiful work published um, regularly by um, several groups or many groups. Uh, and I would like to finish up on the next slide. Thank you. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry, there, there was a mistake. Um, no, I think we can forget about that. But let me say that um, the work I spoke about today is highly collective. And I'm the one uh, who is speaking to you with pleasure. Uh, but it, it's a teamwork. No doubt, you know, in, in a scientific laboratory, research laboratory, uh, if you are involved in uh, uh, experimental uh, research, it's a teamwork. And so the, the contribution of uh, many, many people in my group, um, professional researchers, university professors, PhD students and postdocs, their contribution is absolutely essential. And I will finish up by thanking you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.